So if you'd like to hear any lore, and I mean any lore whatsoever from the Fallout series, consider checking out the Patreon from the $1 to the $10 tier. Your voice is heard every single week. Yes, your voice is heard every single week when it comes time to choose the lore. Usually, I ask the Patreon what they'd like to hear, but because this is a special episode, episode 300, I chose the lore. And this week's lore, from every single instance of Fallout in the Fallout series, I bring you the lore of the Enclave. The Enclave. There's some things that I have to talk about prior to the actual Fallout lore. It's real world lore. We're going to learn a little bit. Uh, I get to be the history channel for about 10 minutes. Fallout's main antagonist, not in every game, they're pretty much in every game. The only game that they're not in is Fallout 4, but they are mentioned in Far Harbor. And the XO1 power armor, more or less, is the advanced power armor, the Enclave power armor from Fallout 2. The Enclave is regarded as a quasi-state. Now, there are some words and some terms that I am about to say that I know the YouTube algorithm doesn't like, and I know some people hear, and it lights up their brain in a completely wrong way, and I just need you to know we're not here to have that conversation. A quasi-state, defined by Wikipedia as a political entity that does not represent a fully autonomous, sovereign state with its own intentions. It's also defined as a deep state. Again, from Wikipedia, according to an American political conspiracy theory, the deep state is a clandestine network of members of the federal government, especially within the FBI and the CIA, working in conjunction with high-level financial, industrial, industrial enterprises, and leaders to exercise power alongside or with the elected United States government. Uh, to quote Arcane Gannon himself, when the courier asks him, do you always deflect personal questions? Arcade Gannon will say, only to obfuscate my past association with a fascist paramilitary organization. They're also regarded as a fascist group. Uh, again, I'm hesitant to bring up that word because that word is just used as something to throw in somebody's face to make fun of them. So I'm going to give you quite literally the definition of fascism. And as an Italian, I feel like I can talk about it. <laughs> Wikipedia's definition of fascism is fascism is a far-right authoritarian ultra-nationalist political ideology and movement characterized by dictatorial leader, a central autocracy, martialism, forcible suppression of opposition, beliefs in a natural social hierarchy, subordination of ind individual interests for the perceived good of a nation or race, and strong regimentation of a society and the economy. All that to be said to pretty much say they are people that have their own interests at heart and nothing else. They care about them and themselves only. They claim to be the continuation of the United States government. The Enclave were individuals in the United States government and people with money pretty much started up a collective. They started up a group of people that thought, hey, when the bombs come, we don't want to give up the power. The Enclave would go on to hijack Project Safe House, making it so... The vaults were no longer to save humanity, but to experiment on humans. According to the White Spring Surveillance Records 1.1.2, after the bombs dropped, the Enclave murdered any non-Enclave members to ensure total control and to, quote, continue the war on communism. The ideology of the racism has pretty much devolved into pseudoscience racism and social Darwinism. They pretty much believe that because they are the big brains, they have the rights to everything. They have the rights to all sorts of power. And because they are pure humans, this sounds a lot like a German Austrian fella from the 30s and the 40s, uh, because they are pure humans, they are not... Have, they do not have any sort of mutation. They are entitled to the U.S. and to control the U.S. for what it is now. Darwinism from Wikipedia, because I want to make sure I get all of this correct. A theory of biological evolution deployed by English naturalist Charles Darwin and others stating that all species of organisms arise and develop through natural selection of small inherent variations that increase the individual's ability to compete, survive, and reproduce. Survival of the fittest. 
they see any human that is mutated to be less than. Even if you are a pure specimen, a pure human with zero mutation, because you are not Enclave, they see you as less than human. They set out to destroy anything that is non, non-enclave, even see non-political wastelanders as essentially mutant scum. They themselves, enclave, are the only true humans. They believe in slavery, human experimentation, and it's just okay with killing American citizens as long as they are not enclave. Essentially, they aren't America They are the rich old white men that even in the face of nuclear war didn't want to give up their power. Even though most of them wouldn't live much longer after October 23rd, 2077. They have all of these these contingency plans in order and none of it's even going to matter. What did you think was going to happen when the bombs fell? You're going to tell all these people we have to continue to go to war against the red Chinese communist and none of that is even really a thing anymore because the Great War happens and as soon as the Great War happens, the Great War is over. I believe, and I'm probably misquoting this, the Great War lasts about 17 minutes. It's not even a full episode of The Simpsons. It, It lasts no amount of time whatsoever and they are ready to continue life. Like, that's why the Greenbrier is all fancy. Like, the robots took care of it and everything, yes, but, like, you go in there and it's pristine. And, like, they wanted that. They wanted it to be... They wanted it to be just white. They wanted it to just be... Just you go in there and the carpet is is vacuumed and everything is swept. They wanted to continue life, but that life doesn't exist anymore. They originally wanted to be able to leave Earth after the bombs fell and populate another planet. But later on, for some unknown reason, the plans changed. What they were trying to achieve after that was a clean sweep of anything mutated with a 99.9% extermination rate. Now, we understand you and I who the Enclave is a little bit better. We know who the Enclave is. We have an understanding of who the Enclave is at this point because of the games that we've played. And not only... The games that we've played, but the things that I've said, and maybe you've looked into some things. Maybe you've listened to Chad. Maybe you've listened to Rad King. You've listened to King Fan Man, a Mantis video, an Oxhorn video. You have an understanding. The Enclave is incredibly, incredibly interesting. But now I want to talk about the origins of the Enclave, kind of where they've come from. And in this, it, so these are other notes that I had to take that aren't in my book because I realized I did it out of order. And I have another like eight pages here that we have to go through quick. I learned about U.S. history. I learned about the country I live in, history and politics and branches of government that I didn't really truly understand. Pre-war They were made up of U.S. presidents, joint chiefs of staff, which I didn't really know much about, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about them now. The joint chiefs of staff are chairman of the chief of staff, the vice chairman of the chief of staff, the chief of staff of the army, uh, the commandant of the marine corps, the chief of naval operations, chief of the staff of the air force, chief of space operations, which is newer. It's dependent on space force. So that might not be in fallout lore and chief of the national guard bureau. Now it's not said that every single person in that is part of the enclave, but they were people taken from that. Prize-winning scientists were also part of it. Members of the U.S. military, influential politicians, wealthy industrialists. Control station Enclave is the Poseidon oil rig. Helios 1, again, was a, a company owned by Poseidon, Poseidon Energy, to make a laser weapon. That, how do I have it written down here? Helios 1 being, being Enclave tech to make a f- space laser. <laughs> a derivative company of Poseidon, Poseidon Energy. The Enclave is basically behind every single conspiracy theory known to man in the, uh, in the Fallout universe. Now, I'm going to say this wrong. Quere Virum which is Latin for Seek the Truth, is a pre-war organization that believed the government was hiding the existence of extraterrestrial life. This is just to prove how deep the rabbit hole truly, truly goes. They were people that had a mole in their group, but were very close to unearthing some diabolical, some, some nasty, awful stuff about the Enclave. And they found out about the MPLX plasma pistol that is essentially a reverse-engineered alien weapon. Now, I couldn't find anything concrete, but the way the wiki, and I get all of my lore off of the Fallout wiki, fallout.fandom.com, the Nuka 
Wikipedia, if you will. It's where I get all of my Fallout lore. The way the wiki laid it out, it seemed very much like the plasma weapons were derivative of alien tech, that they were reverse engineered from alien tech to give us plasma weapons. And I believe, I don't have it written down here, which I'm surprised I don't. If I remember correctly, the plasma weapons didn't come out till about 14 years before the Great War actually happened, which would make sense why the Bad, Tal Ta Bad Talifa, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, Explosives, and Lasers doesn't have plasma weapons in there. They didn't have enough time to add it. Again, not sure if that's canon. That's just what I gleamed off of the Nukipedia. So the Enclave knew that nuclear war was going to happen and they started to prepare for it. Poseidon Oil, the oil rig off the coast of the Pacific Ocean, the White Springs Congressional Bunker, a hub for future Enclave operations, which is inside of Appalachia, uh, Raven Rock, which is outside of DC in the south of Pennsylvania, which is actually probably just about uh, maybe an hour drive from the capital of Pennsylvania, Harrisburg. And I thought that was pretty neat as someone who grew up in Pennsylvania. Raven Rock was designed after the beginning of the Cold War and a Zax computer was put there to run end of the world scenarios and store data. Also, they had the Kovac Maldun, which was a satellite system that the inhabitants of the White Spring bunker could use to watch over Appalachia. You can find the Kovac Maldun in in Appalachia, you can find the Kovac, Kovac Maldun platform a uh, piece of the satellite. And now what you probably know of, what we all know Fallout for, Project Safehouse or the vaults. The vaults were never intended to save anyone. They were social experiments. From the Enclave oil rig, the Enclave could monitor the vaults. So without spoiling a little bit of the lore, the Enclave oil rig pretty much operated from 2077 all the way up until 2242. And that entire time they were watching the other vaults. They could see what other vaults were doing what. So while Vault 101 was sealed with the idea that no one is coming in or out until pretty much the people inside are all dead, they watched while Vault 87 was experimenting with FEV. <clears throat> they watched while Vault 108 was experimenting with cloning. They watched while Vault the Vault 22 was slowly succumbing to overgrowth and <laughs> becoming this festering hub of people turning into half people, half plant. The Enclave sat by and watched. The Enclave actually gave the all clear to Vault 8 in 2087, 10 years after the bombs had dropped, and this vault had a geck. Now Vault 8 gets let out, they have their geck, they start to use the geck, and Vault 8 goes on to be outside of Shady Sands for Vault 15. Vault 8 and Vault 15 are two of the most successful vaults. Vault 8 goes on to be Vault City. They were actually supposed to get two gecks? because uh, they wanted to ensure their success. But they got a misshipment from another vault. If you go to a fella named McClure in Vault 8, you can have a conversation with him. The chosen one can say, what was in the shipment from Vault 13? McClure, water chips, hundreds or so. I don't know why they needed so many. We never needed to replace ours. We had the same water chips since the day our people lived underground in the vault. Vault City got all of the water chips that Vault 13 was supposed to get. And no, I don't think that was intended from Jump. I think that's very much Fallout 2 writing. If Fallout 2 does anything right, it's its writing. And I think it's just the joke of this part of the map that you couldn't access in the first game. There are quite literally hundreds of things that, that we could have used that is not too far and it could have saved us and the whole game could have been wrapped up. It's like, have you ever seen the meme about Breaking Bad in the UK? Walter White goes in, they, they're like, Walt, you have cancer. And he's like, oh my God. And they're like, your treatment starts tomorrow. And he never has to sell meth. Vault City's Gek would later break down and the components be, would be used elsewhere. The Enclave knew of Vault 13 pretty much being in an intact state, which is how they knew it was untouched. They knew that the people in there were natural humans. They wanted to use the data from the vaults to make 
a multi-generational starship to colonize other planets. If you speak to President Dick Richardson during the events of Fallout 2, Dick Richardson will say, we had a number of sanctuaries that would enable the glorious American civilization to endure. These facilities, the vaults, were part of a great plan. The Chosen One. Those damn vaults didn't work the way they were supposed to at all. A lot of people died in them. The President Dick Richardson will say, actually, they worked almost exactly the way they were supposed to. You might call it a social experiment on a grand scale. The Chosen One will say, an experiment? The President Dick Richardson will say, the vaults were set up to test humanity. Some had not enough food synthesizers, Others only had men in them, yet, yet others were designed to open after only six months. They each had a unique set of circumstances designed to test the occupants. Just before the Great War, March 2077, according to the Fallout Bible, 2077, March, prepared for a nuclear or biological attack from China, the President and the Enclave retreat to remote sectors all around the globe to make a contingency plan for continuing the war. People always had conspiracy theories, but most people had no idea that the the, about the Enclave and what they could do. There was a fellow by the name of uh, Senator Blackwell who tried to, that would try to investigate the White Springs bunker and Thomas Eckhart, who would later become a president of the United States, which I'll get into in just a moment, uh, put a hit, threatened his daughter, threatened Blackwell's daughter. Uh, after the bombs fell, Blackwell became a free state, which I've talked about the free states. I'm not going to get too into here, but they, uh, they, they became kind of like a bunch of freedom fighters for the people of Appalachia. The Enclave Society. So now we know a little bit about who the Enclave were. We know about a little bit about their beliefs. Let's talk about who they are in a society. Based on pre-war America, led by an elected Enclave president, elected only by Enclave citizens, and the president has no term limits. Again, a little... American history for you either outside of the U.S. or just didn't know this, the reason why a president can serve for eight years or two terms is because our first president, George Washington, did eight years and went, okay, I think I'm done. Some of the enclave presidents being the last U.S. president pre and post 2077, Thomas Eckhart, who was president from 2083 to 2086. Later, it was uh, Modus, kind of. The Appalachian enclave is kind of in a weird spot because everyone died and the last surviving member was an AI. So the AI becomes the president. So by from 2086 onward, it says he's president, but is he? Uh, there's Richard Sr. pre 20, 2220 and then 2220 was his last year. Dick Richardson, his son, who you get to meet in Fallout 2, uh, is president from 20. 2220 to 2242, John Henry Eden from 2242 to 2277, and Augustus Autumn, kind of, depending on how the game goes, you can have John Henry Eden self-destruct. Uh, John Henry Eden can self-destruct if you can talk to him the right way about it, and he'll blow up Raven Rock. And then Augustus Autumn, like, technically is president, even though a U.S. presidency isn't... It isn't secession. Like, I... The, like... If the president dies, then the vice president becomes president, but it's not like, like Augustus Autumn isn't the vice president. He's just like the general, like he's just the dude with the gun in charge of the soldiers. Organizations that are under the presidency, the Appalachian Enclave, the HQ of it was the White Springs Congressional Bunker. The bunker was built with the Department of Agriculture's money via Thomas Eckhart, who was the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, and for a spell, the president of the United States. Something that I think is super interesting that I don't think a lot of people have ever really thought of in the U S if the president dies, the next person to become president is the vice president. So when JFK was assassinated, when John Fitzgerald Kennedy was assassinated, Lyndon B. Johnson immediately took over. I believe like I could be wrong when I say this, I think it's the, uh, hospital that Kennedy was in. LBJ was sworn in like like in the same building. I could be wrong when I say that, but I'm, I think that's how it happened. He was on Air Force One. So the way secession works is the president. If the president dies, it's the vice president. After the vice president, speaker of the house, uh, 
Press pro tempore of the Senate, Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Defense, uh, the Attorney General, Secretary of the Interior, Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Commerce, of Labor, of Health and Human Services, Housing and Urban Development, Transportation, Energy, Education, Veteran Affairs, and Homeland Security. That are the 18 levels that I could find on Wikipedia that is what happened if every single person in government just dies. Uh, Thomas Eckhart was the Secretary of Agriculture. And like I said, that's how the White Spring Bunker was built, was funneling cash from there. The president also has the vice president and the president and the VP make the executive branch. The enclave has a Congress, but has never mentioned a judicial branch. Little personal lore. When I was in seventh grade, I had a very great teacher. His name was Mr. Lee, rest in peace. Mr. Lee uh, made me stand up in front of the class and explain the three branches of government. And he said to me, Vince, you'll never forget what the three branches of government do. And I walked out of that class and immediately forgot what the three branches of government do. The government agencies had been completely taken over by Enclave. Some of them were entirely Enclave run. It's never said about the FBI or the CIA, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the CIA was in on it. Um... Because of some things that happened in the 60s that I'm kind of afraid to talk about, all I'm going to say is I am not suicidal, nor have I ever been. Um, but the guy who killed Kennedy was one hell of a shot, and it's a little crazy that he died, like, right away. Also, um, I really enjoyed the speakings of Martin Luther King Jr., and... Uh, that's all I'm going to say. And again, I'm not suicidal, nor have I ever been. In the late 2230s, up until 2241 is when the Enclave was truly, truly in its heyday. They ruled with their secrecy, their pervasive surveillances, and their conformity ruled all throughout the Enclave, especially during the Richardsons, both of them the father and son presidency. When speaking to an Enclave comm officer, the chosen one could say, uh... I meant I was the one chosen to fix the comms unit. Seems like nothing works around here. The, co the Enclave comms officer will say, <laughs> ain't that the truth? Just don't let anyone who's got the president ear hear that. You'll be making cattle runs to New Reno till the end of time, pal. All kinds of complaints were seen as an act of disloyalty. Again, the comms unit guy from the Enclave. Yeah, you know how unhappy he gets when people complain. He takes it personally, like a loyalty thing. Maybe that just goes with being president of the United States. What's left of them? The Navarro base commander can say, disobeying a direct order of a superior officer is treason. I don't have time to court-martial you, so I'll handle this myself. Guards, kill this idiot. This is, this is something. This is an organization that rules entirely by fear. They don't care about their people. They never did. They never will. They are doing this because... They know they want control. That's all it is. That's all it ever has been is control. Firing squads for the Enclave are not uncommon. If that got rid of the opposition, especially if the opposition was inside, that's what got rid of it. Enclave net is also a basic form of early internet used for information and data storage. It was used for data, data keeping, uh, sharing with one another. They also use it to talk to other Enclave bases and it was adapted from Poseidon Net, again, which was a Enclave corporation. Poseidon Energy, Poseidon Oil, was an, uh, was an Enclave operation where they took it and retrofitted it for themselves. Now the mindset of the Enclave, they claim to be the continuation of America represent an America without checks and balances. Thomas Eckhart, being the Secretary of Agriculture, ordered any non-enclave members of Congress killed after 10 2077 October 30, 2077, Secretary of Treasury dies to radiation poisoning. Eckhart takes the presidency. Votes take place with who believes in Eckhart's plan. Anyone who opposed inside of the room they were in, was gassed. All of this under the guise to end communism. March 31st of 2080, anything, anything questionably human was used to be test on, but also Enclave members started to question their own duties. The Enclave was raising the DEF CON levels by releasing those mutants and hostile robots to attack humans. 
Somewhere in this time is where the Appalachian Enclave lost contact with the rest of the Enclave. And they started releasing these, these things at the same time. The Scorcher Beasts, the humans, the little robot things, uh, the little Chinese robots that you see at the beginning of Fallout 76, those are not Chinese. They are Enclave. They are, proposi they are proposition. Propaganda robots. All to raise the DEFCON level so they can have access to the nuclear silos once again to continue to bomb China. By December 24th of 2081, Americans were still so brainwashed into believing that a war still mattered that the Enclave started to take in anyone as soldiers. Many of the existing ranks of Appalachian Enclave were not happy about this. By 2085, all of the Appalachian Enclave fell into a civil war. Thomas Eckhart had his generals killed and an uprising took place. Modus would go into a kill all of the remnants members of the White Springs bunker. Now, Modus is the multi-operational directional unit system, an AI who would later technically become president within this 55-year period between 2085 to 2140. By 2140, we had President Dick Richardson, and in his State of the Nation address, he says, Fellow Americans, I have been honored to be the stalwart that will take the American people back to the mainland and reclaim the United States for its own citizens. We will be the first generation free of the mutant threat in over a hundred years. Through the brave and tireless efforts of our own head of chemical corpse, Dr. Charles Curling, the hour of salvation is now at hand. Now they believe that mutations meant the end of the human race. It's a thing that you see with neo-Nazis all the time. If one group of people has more power or is more prevalent than the rest of us, then we lose who we are, and that's not good, because then we don't have power. And they very much saw mutations, because super mutants are bigger and stronger, uh, they saw this as a huge detriment to, essentially, white people. Like, they saw this as a huge detriment to the human race. They also genuinely believed this, or tricked themselves into believing this, or just wanted to be safe and powerful under enclave rule. If you talk to Dr. Charles Curling, the man who develops uh, FEV Curling 13, when asking about it and how they're going to get rid of all the mutants, he said two weeks for the virus to spread, another month or so for all of it to run its course, and then the United States will be ready for recolonization by real humans. Our species will have been saved. And the chosen one can say, you really think you're doing the right thing, don't you? And Charles Curling will say, yes, I do. There is no price too high to pay for the salvation of one species. Any of all humans, and this is a quote directly from the wiki, directly from the game, Guilty of mutation were to be gassed by a modified FEV, FEV Curling 13, based on FEV 2 found at the Mariposa military base. On July 20th of 2036, Enclave scouts found the Mariposa military base, chemical corpse and slaves started to dig it out, and this is where Horrigan got exposed to FEV and later, and later sent to the oil rig for study. March 16th of 2242, Enclave raided Vault 13, looking for pure humans to experiment on, to experiment the FEV curling 13 on. That's where the 13 comes from. Only 0.0001% needed to be annihilated. Kills their victims in 60 seconds. It gets into their... Gets into their lungs. Uh, there's a burning sensation. It eats them from the inside out. If you have even the slightest bit of radiation, any sort of mutation on you, you are affected by this. Just mere hours before the toxin of FEV curling 13 was meant to be released into the atmosphere, the Chosen One destroys the oil rig, killing everyone on it, including Dr. Curling, President Dick Richardson, and Frank Horrigan. Surviving Enclave members were sent eastward, by the commands of President John Henry Eden. There is an elect there is there was an election, but for security reasons, they say, uh, well, you know, we have to kind of keep that clandestine. We gotta keep it on the low. They said that there's they said that there is this 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 election that happened. They can't talk about it for security reasons. I have written down in my notes exactly bullshit. The president is a fucking robot. 
<laughs> he just assumed power. Uh, this version of the Enclave still wants to take back the mainland and destroy anything mutated. They have their own modified FEV that could be placed into the water supply. They also don't want to hide the existence of the Enclave and broadcast it to the entire wasteland, or at least DC. Very much priding themselves on old-fashioned American values. Promising financial programs, counseling, childhood programs, and also promoting death to anybody who opposes. So you have now a group of people that have come in very much in the sense of lawful evil. We're going to do what's best for you. We're going to do what we think is best for you. And we want you on our side. I feel like chaotic evil is everyone get out of my way. But lawful evil is very much, we would love to have you. We're going to do an atrocity, like multiple atrocities. But we would love to have, like genuinely, we would love to have you. So show up, hang out, have a drink, as long as you're on our side. That's what the Enclave in DC is promoting. John Henry Eden also has his lapdog, Augustus Autumn. Autumn might actually be worse than John Henry Eden. When Eden gives the order to not attack the Lone Wanderer in Raven Rock, Autumn reverses it. Now, I've recently played through this, and I remember it vaguely. And if you talk to President Eden when he dismisses Autumn, he said, you can say to him, like, look, let me just come up and talk to you. There's no reason to shoot. And after walking around for a few minutes, he Autumn just reverses it. And then when you get to... Uh, the door right before Autumn's, there's two Securitrons, and they'll shoot at the Enclave officers that are shooting at you. Also, the Jingoist, I believe his name is Nathan, in Megaton, is in Raven Rock, and he was captured, and he's like, I lied! What I said was wrong! They don't look out for people! Like, he goes back on his word. Because he uh, realizes he was sold a crock of shit. He will kill everyone and everything that opposes the Enclave. Again, Augustus Autumn has control of the soldiers, and John Henry Eden has control over the Raven Rock tech. And now they don't trust each other. Autumn has to listen to President Eden because he's the president, but also they don't trust each other. They think that the two of them are going to go against each other at any given moment. And you can't have a working relationship. You can't have a relationship like that. Even though it's it's a it's a, a like a Nazi and a computer, you can't have a relationship like that. They don't trust each other. They don't think they have each other's best interest at heart. The Lone Wanderer can say to Autumn, give it up, Autumn, you've lost. And Autumn will say, I beg to differ. The Enclave is at the height of its power. Once this facility is operational, Project Purity is what he's referring to, uh, the masses will flock to the Enclave for fresh water protection and a plan for the future. This implies to me that he actually kind of cares a little bit about people. He thinks that if we just kill all the mutants, then people are going to see us as genocidal monsters. But if we say, hey, we have free water, come here and show up and we can work out a deal that pushes things forward. But if you don't agree with him, he's ready to kill you in an instant. So it really hits you with this like, well, what, what do you want type thing? Now, some of the known locations of the Enclave and uh, what happened after the bombs fell. In Appalachia, Eckhart took control and lasted less than a decade as president, uh, needed to raise the DEFCON levels to one again. So they released the Liberator robots, the Super Mutants, and the Scorcher Beasts into the waste to continue to nuke China. By 2086, Appalachia's Enclave was no longer anything other than an idea. Modus was the only surviving member. By 2102, Vault 76 is let out. And by 2103, people have finally come back to Appalachia. Now, in California, starting in 2140, the Enclave officially adopted the ideology of a pure, mutation-free master race. They have adopted genocide. By 2198, via the Fallout Bible, the Enclave works on various new technologies, including power armor variations. None of these are much of an improvement over the conventional old-school power armor and some actually worse. If I say the Fallout Bible, I am quoting it directly. In 2215, Enclave Power Armor research is started. This is the suits that are worn in Fallout 2. And this project is complete by 2220. By 2235, the Enclave starts to experiment on death claws in order to make cheap, dispensable, but powerful soldiers. In 2236, July to August of 2236, again from the Fallout Bible, Enclave scientists and the Chemical Corps scour the remains of Mariposa, while assault squads comb the desert for slaves they can use to mine the vats. One of the squads includes a soldier, Frank Horrigan, 25 at the time, recently removed from on-duty presidential secret service to take some R&R time. 
in the waste after some undocumented blunder or another. Uh, again, from the Fallout Bible, September of 2236, Enclave construction crews and super mutant slaves begin excavation. They uncover the FEV virus in Mariposa. Mutations begin to occur in human workers. Frank Horrigan comes in contact with FEV and is sent to the Enclave labs for study. January of 2237, Enclave obtains a pure sample of FEV. Super mutants rise up against the Enclave and the Enclave suffers heavy casualties. The mutants run them out of Mariposa. The pure sample was then used by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Curling to make FEV Curling 13. Again, via the Fallout Bible from 2236 to 2238, Horgan gradually mutates from exposure to FEV, gaining the physique of a slow, stupid, single-minded and the single-mindedness of a super mutant. He is kept heavily sedated, operated on, and studied. He is conscious for only brief periods at a time, then quickly sedated after the bloodshed is over. So he's waking up and killing people and going right back to sleep and they're working on him more and more. March 27th of 2239, Horrigan is manufactured for his new role. A new version of power armor is built to accommodate his mass and he is sealed inside. After a few horrifically successful field tests, Horrigan becomes the Enclave solution to many of its sticky problems. In 2241, the FEV Curling 13 project was nearly complete. Enclave started to run low on chemical supplies, so they worked a deal with the Salvatore crime family in New Reno to deliver chemicals to the Enclave in exchange for laser pistols. The Enclave has a superhuman super weapon, and they are trading guns with Tony Soprano so they could have more chemicals to make more of their, their poison. They have all the money and resources in the world, but are talking to these, these lowly people and are like, we'll give you shitty cheap guns, but because they've never seen plasma weapons, they're like, gimme, 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 gimme. Again, from the Fallout Bible, May 16th of 2242, Vault 13 is opened only to be greeted by two Enclave Verta assault squads. The squads kill three of the citizens who were resisting capture and they storm the vault, kidnapping all of its inhabitants. At just about the same time, the village of Arroyo is raided in order to get test subjects for FEV Curling 13. By the fall of 2242, FEV Curling 13 was complete with a 99.9 .9 success rate, 250,000 gallons of which were developed to release into the atmosphere. Just hours before this could happen, the Chosen One would kill Frank Horrigan and President Dick Richardson, triggering a nuclear explosion, destroying the toxin and stopping global genocide. Now, obviously, because of all this, they had stopped another Holocaust. And the Enclave is still a functioning thing at this point. Navarro is still a base that is operating. It is the, the biggest base on land that is not the oil rig. It is the base outside of the oil rig. I would, I would say in the hierarchy, it would be the oil rig and then Navarro. And this is the, the destruction of the oil rig is a massive blow to the Enclave. In late 2242, surviving soldiers and other Enclave members regrouped at Navarro. And Autumn Sr., Augustus Autumn, uh, his father, is contacted by the new president, John Henry Eden, who is the successor for President Dick Richardson, to take a majority of the Enclave eastward to Washington, D.C., a few years later, in 2246, which is also the same year that Arcade Ganon is born, he's also born in Navarro, the NCR would invade Navarro. Uh, the courier can ask Judah Kerrig, uh, an Enclave remnant, what happened to the Enclave oil rig in Navarro? And Judah will respond with, internal sabotage took down the oil rig. Never did quite get the full story. The NCR took out Navarro, saying we posed a threat to the region. The Enclave remnants either fled east or integrated into the NCR. Now, we know of some of the we know of some of the remnants, and I'm gonna get into them in just a moment. In 2242, Raven's Rock is established as the new headquarters of the Enclave. They maintain a low profile, staying at Raven Rock and Adams Air Force Base to build up its army. By 2277, it is essentially the plot of Fallout 3. Uh, they want to overtake Project Purity. 
the Enclave do as you get back in contact, as the Lone Wanderer gets in contact with his dad, he says, I need to uh, get back to Project Purity. We can make this work. I know where to find a Gek. I know where to do all this stuff. I know how to make all of this happen. You get back to Project Purity. As you get back, the Enclave decides now is the time to strike. They then take over Project Purity, kicking you out. And James, the Lone Wanderer's father, sacrifices himself in order to make sure that James and his wife, Catherine, who was now deceased for about almost two decades, their work can continue on. They, the people that they want to give free water to, free and clean water to, can have that ability and they can continue on in the life that they want to give to these people. The Enclave continues to shadow the Lone Wanderer all the way to Vault 87, where he finally gets his hands on a Gek and it is robbed from him, and the Gek is then taken by the Enclave to go back to Project Purity to get it set up the way they want it to be set up. Eden will then bribe you once you're at Raven Rock, and he takes you in, uh, and he wants to speak with you. He can bribe you by giving you this modified FEV that will kill any sort of mutation. Much like Curling 13 from Fallout 2, you are given this modified FEV that can be put into the water and will kill anything with any sort of a mutation. Somewhere in there, when talking to him, you can convince John Henry Eden to self-destruct and blow up Raven Rock and pretty much be like, hey man, it's over. There's not much we can do. It's over. Uh, once the Lone Wanderer gets back, he regroups with the Brotherhood of Steel and they deploy Liberty Prime to destroy any Enclave on the way. And it's one of the coolest parts of any Fallout game is in Fallout 3 when you follow Liberty Prime all the way from the, from the Pentagon to the Memorial, from, from the Citadel to Project Purity. And you take out every single vertebrate, you take out everything while you're on your way there. Now, when you're, when you're taking it back before you go to activate Project Purity, you have the option to kill... Augustus Autumn, if you'd like. Um, the last time I played through, I, I did kill him, but it's an option. You don't have to kill him. You can kill him. It's completely up to you. You do what you'd like in that situation. He is then the president, kind of, of the NCR and the US. It's like, mm, type, type shit. Like, he is, but like, is he? The Enclave had access to a mobile base crawler, and they had satellite missiles. The Brotherhood goes to attack the Enclave for one last time. To destroy the Enclave, once and for all, they use these missiles to destroy Liberty Prime. You then have to go to Adams Air Force Base to go after the mobile base, the mobile crawler base, and take out the rest of them. And you use their own weapon against them. You use their own missiles to bomb themselves. But you could also bomb Megaton. You could bomb the Citadel. Uh, you could bomb a few other places in the Capital Wasteland. But you use the weapon essentially on them. It's the Brady Hercules High Orbit Mini Nuclear Bombardment. And like I said, at the Adams Air Force Base, the Lone Wonder gets access and uses it against themselves. Up until about that point, as far as we know, that's the end of the Enclave story. Now, as of this recording, the Fallout Amazon Prime show has not come out, so maybe we'll get to see some remnants because it does take place on the West Coast. In 2281, you can meet some of the Enclave remnants in the Mojave. You can meet Doc Henry, who's in Jacobstown, Cannibal Johnson, who lives in his cave, Ornman Reno, who lives in his house in the Mojave, Daisy Whitman, who lives in Novak, Judah Kruger, who lives in Westside and Arcade Gannon, uh, who lives in Freeside, the Mormon Fort, who's a follower of the Apocalypse. Uh, they all have access to a small vertebrate refueling station near Mount Charleston right by Jacobstown and all the equipment that they have been used have that they've had has been sitting there for years decades even the courier can convince them to fight on whichever side they believe is the right side when it comes time to fight for Hoover Dam by the latest that we know anything of the Enclave is 2287, a fellow by the name of Brian Richter. He was left for dead after a recon mission and sometime after the fall of Raven Rock. He now lives at the Nucleus in Far Harbor and has devoted his life to Adam, becoming a zealot of the religion. That's everything that we have pretty much about the Enclave recorded. Their relations with the outside are none. They keep to themselves. The Enclave does imply the way that they have government officials. It would have been outside of the U.S. Yes, they were trying to build the U.S. back up, but there's no doubt in my mind that in the U.K., uh, maybe even in parts of Asia, certain parts of Asia, South America, uh, Australia even, 
there are Enclave members out there. I don't believe Desmond Lockhart is part of the Enclave, uh, but it's also super surprising that Mr. House is not. Uh, I didn't see anything about House on the wiki, so I'm assuming he's not part of it. I wouldn't be surprised if he was approached to join and he was like, no, no, I own a city already. I'm good. I got plans, brother. So just some behind the scenes for you. And I get, like I said prior, I get all of my lore off of fallout.fandom.com and I wanted to read the behind the scenes stuff directly off of the wiki, the Nukipedia. In Fallout 2, the Enclave was originally conceived by Tim Kaine as a way to explain why the United States government only commissioned a relative handful of vaults that were unable to protect a substantial amount of American citizens. While not spelled out in the details of the game, the idea was that the vaults were actually grand experiments supporting the creation of a multi-generational starship to flee Earth. After it was rendered uninhabitable by the Great War. While the starship is not alluded to, the entire premise of the vaults being part of a grand experiment of some higher purpose is included in the game. Kane explained the situation in detail 21 years later. In early development for Fallout 3, Bethesda used a different set of emblems for the Enclave and its vertebrate fleets that were drawn by concept artist Adam Adamowitz. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm awful at people's last name. A prototype Air Force emblem can still be seen on the wreckage of Vertibirds in Fallout 3. In Fallout 4 and 76, an alternate Enclave logo was featured on the shirt, which is no longer being sold on the Bethesda, the Bethesda gear store. It was advertised as a special edition of the Enclave logo, featuring a flourishing red, white, and blue. Additionally, Enclave-style items have been released for 76, including the Enclave Signal Man outfit, Enclave... Intel officer outfit and power armor skins. The Enclave is essentially the entire series' bad guy. The entire nuclear war was perpetrated by these individuals. These are people that 200 plus years later, their actions are so heavily felt in the Fallout world. They're so heavily felt by the vaults. They're so heavily felt by science in general. They're so, 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 so heavily felt. And without the Enclave, we really don't have... We really don't have a lot of the fun that we have from Fallout 2. Like, outside of Enclave writing, like, we get Horrigan because of Enclave. One of the greatest antagonists ever, if not... Fallout's greatest antagonist. The Enclave is something that I did a long time ago. I covered a long time ago and I wasn't happy with it. And I think I did it as a milestone episode. I wasn't happy with it. It was way longer than I thought it was going to be. And I read it directly off the wiki. And it's something that I'm really, really upset with. Our April Fool's Day episode where we played Minecraft, that one was the beginning of the Enclave. Now this has its own special thing. Thank you for listening to that. I know it's a lot. I tried to truncate as much as I could to make it bite-sized and understandable for those who are new to the series. And also, you know, you don't want to hear every little detail about every single character. Uh, thank you for 300 episodes. I would like to thank the chat that's here tonight, too. You fellas are the best. I love you all very, very much. And that is this week's lore. Hey, everybody. Wasn't that great? Didn't you enjoy that? A little bit of Fallout lore to start your day? Maybe midday Fallout lore? Hell, right before bedtime? Doesn't get any better than this. If you like this, check out the Patreon. There's a link in the description below. If you want to have your voice heard, if you want me to do a certain piece of lore, the best way to get in contact with me is through the Patreon. The people who are on screen right now, I gotta thank them. Thank you to these fine folks right now. Because of them, the show can continue to grow and get bigger and better. And if you want to check it out, from the $1 tier to the $10 tier, your voice is heard every single week. I film the full Atomic Radio Hour podcast episodes live in our Discord. Hey, you know what? While you're here, check out the Discord. There should be a link in the description below. Check out my Twitter. Check out the show's Twitter. Come hang out. It's a good time. My name has been Vince. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Thank you for supporting. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you to the Patreon. I love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one.